If you want to quit drinking for 90 days, if you want to improve relationships, if you want to improve your marriage, your business, if you want to create goals, find accountability, find community with other like-minded dudes, we have some spots open for our men's sober mastermind groups. Go to that soberguide.com slash masterminds and fill out the short application today. That Sober Guy podcast contains adult content, merciless truth, and emotional nudity. Listener discretion is advised. I'm Shane Ramey. You're listening to That Sober Guy podcast, and we help people stay sober. If it's your first time listening, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here today. If you're looking to quit or cut back on your drinking, uh, we have a great 30-day alcohol-free challenge. It's self hundreds of men all over the country. Quit drinking alcohol. Become better fathers, husbands entrepreneurs and leaders in their communities you can sign up today and you can check out all of our other podcasts and resources by going to that sober guide.com be sure to follow us on instagram at that sober guy podcast shout out to my buddy mike tuck if you missed mike's podcast it was out there last month and uh mike connected our guest today and i uh, and our guest today is chris bowers and uh, so shout out to Mike for that. And, and Chris has specialized in the addiction treatment field for over 34 years, really uh, one of the OGs of recovery. As him and I talked a couple weeks ago, got to learn some great things about him and the work that he's doing. Uh, his company, Global Breakthrough Education, provides help for drug abuse, drug addiction, and alcoholism all over the world. Uh, creates uh, 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 programs for treatment centers, uh, goes into, into institutions, and helps uh, private coaching uh, individuals putting together treatment plans, all that good stuff. And I'll let him tell a little bit more about his background uh, as it is extensive. So Chris, uh, we had a couple tech difficulties there as we yeah. got going, but I think we're good now. So uh, welcome to the show, man. I'm good. Yeah. Hey, thank you, but I appreciate it, man. I like, I like the emotional nudity. That's pretty good. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know what? I got to say, I think sure. I, I'll say I borrowed that. I think I heard it. I used to listen to a radio host named Michael Savage out of uh, the mm. Bay Area back in the day. And I think in one of his intros or something, I heard that a long time ago. I said, oh, I like that, man. So I borrowed it for the like show. That. So That's yeah, great. it's good That's stuff. Great. Yeah. So uh, so thanks for once again, man, uh, taking some time coming yeah. on today. Um, I mentioned Mike Tuck, man, R- really great dude. And I'm yeah. so glad he connected us. And uh, I know you guys know each yeah. other from kind of the music business and just being on the road yeah. together. And how, how long have you guys known each other for? I'm sorry. I mean, it's got to be a couple years now. A few years. Yeah, yeah nice, a man. Great guy, though. I mean, the guy's got like one of those hearts that you can see. He radiates yeah. kindness. It's just who he is. It's amazing. 100%. And, and at that, uh, just a phenomenal guitar player, too. I've never seen oh, a yeah. dude just pick like Nuts. that. He's got some good yeah. good talent there. So, and I think, really good. Really I think good. in the last podcast, he had just got uh, a, over, a little over a year sober. So, so great yeah. to see, you know, yeah. great dudes out there having some success in sobriety and their careers. Oh, and yeah. um, that's that's what it's about. So, oh, um, yeah. yeah. So, give so just uh, for those just uh, being introduced to you for the first time, Chris, just give us yeah. a little background about yourself. Man, I, uh, I got sober really young. I was 17 years old, and uh, and I got invited to uh, come to work for the treatment center that I was in at 17. So I was 18 years old, and I had a year sober, and I don't I don't advise anybody to do that. I, I, tell, I tell people to kind of stay, stay clear of the industry for a while. Yeah. Um, but I started off washing dishes in a treatment center. So I literally oh. started off the ground level and worked in pretty much every position there is possible in that end of the treatment centers. Uh, so the recovery industry, I mean, anything that yeah. I've done it a lot of it, you know? Yeah. So, and, and, uh, and what did that, what did that look like for you? Um, just like when, when did alcohol, when did drugs, I don't know the full background or scope of your, yeah. you know, your experience and, and what you kind of went through, but where did that start? And then how did that kind of lead you into, into treatment? Well, I, you know, I started drinking at 11 and I knew right then exactly like I, I was the kid that grew up feeling broken and damaged, you know, yeah. like I was damaged goods, like, like a dinner can of peas in, in, the, in, the, in the grocery store that no one wants. I, that's how it felt like. And then if you walk into the supermarket and go to the, the fruit section, the single bananas that nobody buys, I felt like the single <laughs> banana. It's funny because yeah. I have two daughters and my daughters now will go to the grocery store and they'll head to the bananas like, dad, here's a single banana. You know, do you want it? And we're all sitting there going, oh, you matter. You matter. You know, I'm and, sorry, and, but that's kind of how I grew up. Yeah. Yeah. A little oh, banana. <laughs> you were left on your own. Yeah. We'll and that's kind of how I felt like, you know, so, I mean, yeah. it, I mean, I took several drinks before my 
drink, drink at 11. But it, the phenomenon of craving did develop at that point. It was a little sips here and there. And, and yeah. I got to come from a long line of good alcoholics. And uh, I'm not saying it was their fault. I just was got the, the gift of alcoholism, you know. And at the yeah. time, it wasn't a gift. But it was. But now that being sober, it definitely was. Um, so at 11, man, I mean, it was the phenomenal craving hit me that night. I know I could pinpoint it and it's like, I'm 52 years old now and I can tell you exactly what it was like that first drink. It was magical, yeah. you know? And, wow. and so I remember waking up the next morning thinking in my mind, not knowing I suffered from this illness, but thinking in my mind that, man, I'm going to do that beyond convenience. I'm committed beyond convenience to drink like that every day as hard and fast as I could go. So wow. it led me down a destructive path like most people, you know, yeah. and, and didn't, jail didn't get me sober, but I, I grew up in jails, was in and out of institutions. And you know, my parents tried the best they could to, to, to do the right thing and keep me out and do whatever they had to do. But uh, alcoholism was a little bit stronger than family sometimes. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, for me, it was, uh, you know, waking up that last morning, February 8th of 1989, and there was a moment of clarity that happened in jail that had never happened before. And it wasn't that, oh, my gosh, I'm going to go to prison or, oh, my gosh, I'm going to, you know, do whatever. It wasn't even about I'm going to die of this thing. It was that I wanted something different. And mm. the weird part about that, I should, have still, I should have still been drunk. I mean, I was very intoxicated that night. And I woke up that morning clear as a bell. Mm. And it was the first time ever that I realized that, mas- that alcohol had mastered me, that I was done. You know, I couldn't drink successfully, but yet I couldn't stop I couldn't stay out of institutions, and jails, and and um, and man, it was a, it was a violent world, and you know we all have that stuff. And so, yeah, uh, for me, the the gift was that my mother had already joined Al-Anon six months before I got sober, and had no idea she did it. I just knew there was a difference in her. Yeah, um, and I didn't know it until later on, and and then all of a sudden, I uh, you know, she called an old probation officer I had when I asked for help, and I. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you, you've been in trouble a lot when your mom has the home phone number of the old probation officer, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it was like, she called her, and that lady, her name was Joan Donovan, and she literally, she she set everything in motion for me. And I was ordered to go wow. to treatment um, because of her, and then I was able to uh, uh, have a lot of accountability because of her when I got out, and uh, that lady saved my life. How, how old were you at that time? I was 17. 17, dang, yeah. man. So, yeah, 17. Yeah, yeah. and... um. Was that all in Texas? I know you're in Texas now, right? Is that where no, you're from? Yeah, I'm in Texas now. Yeah, I'm in Texas now, but that was actually in Alabama. Oh, no got real. it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And you, you, yeah. you said something that, that strikes true to me, and I feel like, you know, for those guys out there listening to this, this may speak to them too. I know for me, and it sounds like for you, we both experienced this, and you said that you had this feeling, this inner this, I'll call it like an inner tuition, maybe God speaking, that there was something more for your life, that, that there was something yeah. bigger and you could feel it, but you just didn't know how to break, break free from that. Do you, right. do you, do you think that a lot of guys experience that? And then, um, you know, next to that, like, how do you, if you're a dude out there who is experiencing that, like, how do you find some breakthrough in, in that? Like, how do you go in? Well, I mean, like for myself, it was, it was really, uh, I never happened before. And I'd had a big spiritual moment, even the night while I was drinking, where I couldn't literally move any part of my body from running from the police that I just ran about a mile from. I literally was stuck in place. It was the weirdest thing. And it wasn't because mm-hmm. I was drinking. And uh, God just said, it's time. And I didn't mm-hmm. know that, you know, until later on. But then, you know, I guess for me, that morning waking up, that moment of clarity, the gift of desperation. You, know, mm-hmm. you hear that a lot, but yeah. to be that desperate, to be that willing, because most of us are never that willing. Like to be willing to do everything that's against you, what you want to do, like your core is saying, don't do it. And you go do it anyway. Yeah. That's willingness. You know, most of us aren't that willing to get beaten down pretty hard. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I work with a lot of guys now that haven't experienced that willingness yet. And some mm-hmm. of the ones we just try to work with, uh, whether it be personal level, 12 step stuff or whether we professional stuff, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and some of that is just not knowing what they're suffering from. A lot of people don't realize what alcoholism looks like, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, and and that's, that's a great kind of lead into this next question, I think. So for those out there listening, maybe they have a loved one who's struggling. Maybe it's their spouse or it's their, their, their son or their daughter or somebody that they care about. Like, how do you deal with that? Like you mentioned your mom was in in Al-Anon for six months before, which, which I know is a a great program that's helped a lot of people. Like any thoughts on that or tips, like for someone out there who's really dealing with somebody, like how, how do they deal with that? What do they do? Well, I think for one thing, the families have tried amazingly well. I mean, I mean, it doesn't matter what kind of family you come from. If you're, if you have alcoholism in it, I always give um, just you know, acknowledgement to the families because it's not easy to be a parent to begin with. Then yeah. now you're a parent 
of someone with this illness, you know, and so they tried everything. And usually I come in uh, when they tried everything. Mm. And so uh, as, as interventionists, what I like to do is I try to educate the family as much as possible. And then I show them how this illness has affected them in the way that they are so focused on the alcoholic or addict that they can't see the forest of the trees. Mm. Like they're in the middle of it. Yeah. So, and it's about, you know, they're, you know, they're, my hope is for most families that if you do get a 12 step fan, a 12 step uh, program, for your own stuff, then no matter what the addict or alcoholic does, you have got the tools to be able to deal, to deal with it, to be able to, to find some peace in your own life around your stuff and theirs as well, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's so, good. Yeah. It's such a tough spot to be in. Cause obviously, you know, you, you want to help the person that you love at the same time, yeah. if the person isn't, doesn't love themselves and is not willing to accept the yeah. help, you know, it's just this weird, you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. And I know it's, it's difficult yeah. for, a lot of people, including myself. I mean, I, we, we all yeah. deal with it. I still deal with it till this day. I have a couple yeah. of loved ones who I love more than anything, but like, there's not yeah. a whole lot I can do at this point. You know, I will. I tell people a lot. It's like my whole family's been riddled with this. My sister died at 19. My brother died at 31. Like it, I, we've had multiple murders in our family, suicides, uh, car accidents, left of death. I mean, it's just been riddled through our family. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm really clear with families I work with. Like if, if my kiddos ever have that problem and, and need some support, I'm not going to be the one giving it to them because I'm yeah. a parent. I'm too close. Yeah. I'll bring in somebody that knows what they're doing, you know? Yeah. And that is. Yeah. That, that's um, a, that's a really hard. good point is having that external, um, uh, kind of lens for somebody else to come in mm -hmm. and look at it. Who's not emotionally yeah. attached to the situation, but at right. the same time has been there and has been emotionally attached in their own right. Yeah. Really gives you oh, yeah. a good take and a good ability, I think to evaluate and be yeah. caring and all that kind of stuff too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, when I work with families, I really do a lot of different, uh, tactics. I mean, I try to soften as much as possible and have as much compassion as I can for the family and the, yeah. addict, and the, or the alcoholic who still suffers. And I mean, it's, it's not an easy thing. And yeah. so it's like a lot of, a lot of families just don't have the proper information of what an alcoholic truly looks like or not. Yeah. And then the person that we're doing intervention on, or that's, that's needing the help. Sometimes they're willing to go. Sometimes they aren't. And because they, they're not really given the facts a lot of times about the illness they're living with and, and what happens to them in the long run, yeah. you know? And so my, my job is to help explore that a little bit with them. Yeah. You, you know? know, that that's a great point. And if you don't mind, like, let, let, let me ask you this yeah. real quick, just to real break it down, like simple, like what is like what are some of the um, signs and symptoms of somebody who's struggling, let's say, with alcohol? Right. Well, I mean, if you're the family member from the family member's perspective, or the addict or alcoholic. Uh, let's do both. Can we do both? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. Yeah, why not? Okay. I mean, as the alcoholic, it's really clear, really simple. It's like you look. If you honestly, honest is the word, right? If I honestly want to quit, I find I can't. Or if I have little little control of the amount I take, you're probably an alcoholic. It's that simple. Yeah. Right. A lot of people look at alcoholism as, oh, the guy on the bridge lost his family. A lot of people focus on the outside stuff. You know, he'd been to jail, he went to jail, he didn't go to jail, he lost his kids, got a divorce, didn't. None of that matters. Yeah. Right. I know people that didn't lose any of that, but yet they couldn't stop when they wanted to stop, when they couldn't control the amount they took. So it's really that simple. Um, what I found over my experience is that normal drinkers don't have problems like that. Yeah. Like, it's like it's truly a beverage you know they drink it like a beverage and yeah. it's just kind of one of those things um and then family members i look at i talk to them about that obviously there's a big concern their families usually understand it and see it way before we do you know yeah. my mom saw it way before i did yeah and so and and i think that some of the signs are when when you begin to see that their their attitudes their behaviors and everything about them has changed because I love one of the older definitions of the word obsession. The one of the older definitions of the word obsession was haunted and demon-like. Mm. And if your addiction was like mine, it was haunting and demon-like for everyone around me. Like my yeah. attitude would change and shift on a dime, the Jekyll Hyde all day yeah. long. Yeah. Know? Yeah. I talk about, I had, a, I had a friend and I've talked about this on here before, but I had a friend back in the day. I haven't talked to him in a while. I think he's sober now, actually. Thank God. But um, just a great dude when he was sober, man, give you the shirt off his yeah. back. Oh, and, yeah. the, and the minute yeah. he started drinking, he would want to fight you. He would want to do yeah. dumb stuff. And I'm like, yeah. dude, like what, like what is going on? And it, it's yeah. funny how that, that, you know, the, it's poison. It affects us differently, and, oh, yeah. and, you know, the same, but different for, for different yeah. people. And, um, you know, the other point you made, I thought that was, that was really good is you, you said something about how so many people, 
you know, yes, there's a lot of people who end up getting arrested, <coughs> DUIs, you know, they're, they're, those are those really right. clear signs that we see. It's like, man, this dude probably, like, I, I might have a problem if I got three DUIs. You might have some, you know, some, some uh, yeah. realization there. But for the person who never got in trouble, and that, that was me, right. like, it was so easy to justify. Yeah. I don't know why I never got yeah. a DUI. I don't know why I never, you know, went to jail. I, don't, I, I just was lucky, I guess, yeah. but it made it easier to justify. Oh, I'm not as bad as that. You know, right. my, my buddy over there who has the three DUIs and yeah. the broken relationships and all that. Like, I still yeah. had a job. Um, how do you how do you kind of deal with that? And I I I, right. I would imagine there's an elements of denial that kind of comes in that's wrapped into some mm -hmm. of that too. Like, how do you deal with someone who's who's you know going through that? Well, most of us aren't. It's, it's not really about denial. It's about delusion. It's faced with the facts. I don't mm. want to look at it. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of break through some of that delusion, right? So, I mean, the best way to, to, to is my experience of, of a guy I met. My first guy ever sober that I met was when I walked into a treatment. I'm 17 years old. I'm broken. I am, I'm crying, walking in the door. I don't know what to do. You're about to take away my best friend, but my best friend now is not my best friend. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> and I sit there in front yeah. of this old dude named Joe Peterson. You know, I love him forever. He's, he's not with us anymore. But Joe was an old guy. I was young. He was a um, – um, he did 14 years in the, in the federal penitentiary. For organized crime is a mafia guy out of Chicago. Mm. He had that deep voice and everything. It was great. Yeah. But I had nothing in common with him. Nothing. Right. My consequences for the way I lived my life was nothing like the consequences he, he did. Even though I'd been in jail, even though I'd gone all that, that, that down that rabbit hole, his was different. He was totally different. He was married. I wasn't married. He had kids. I didn't have any kids. Mm. When he began to talk about his loneliness, he began to talk about the desperation he felt and how alcohol, when he tried to quit, he couldn't and how shameful he felt. And man, it was, a, it wasn't 15 minutes into a conversation that I felt just like him. Oh man, it's crazy. And that's when the magic happened. And yeah. I think that's why we're, it's all about the language of the heart, right? Mm. It's all internal, not external. Yeah. So people that haven't experienced those things, I try to, I mean, I think that's something that goes on with our 12 step fellowship these days. I don't want to get in that side of it, except for saying that, it, a lot of times we focus too much on the physical things that happen in yeah. our life, not the actual what alcoholism is, right? Mm. Because the whole thing, this whole thing works because of identification process, right? Me being able to identify the guy across the table from me, yeah, you know, and I can identify emotionally all day long. If, they, yeah. if they're the real alcoholic, real addict all day long. And then he just broke it down around obsession of the mind, the physical allergy, the body that he had. Normal people didn't drink like him. And I got mm. that 100%. You know? Yeah. So, so that connection piece was huge. In other words, <laughs> just that, and, yeah. and it is huge, it is that connection huge. and being able to relate with somebody huge. and hear like, because I, you know, especially alcoholism, any addiction, really, it can be so isolating where we think we're the only one going through it. Right. Um, and then when you hear someone else and it's crazy how you described it too, just totally different backgrounds, like really would have nothing yeah. in common. Just on, if you ran into him on the street and all of a sudden something clicks and you go, Oh my gosh, like yeah. I'm, I know exactly what he's talking about. And that does something to the yeah. heart when, when we do feel yeah. that. Um, yeah. Big time. One, one thing you mentioned, um, you said uh, that my, I think something I, I lost my best friend or I'm about to lose my best friend, but my yeah. best friend's not really my best friend. And I had a client I was talking with recently and that was one of his biggest fears was like, how am I going to operate and function in right. everyday life without right. alcohol? Like, that's all I know pretty much. And so yeah. there's a lot of fear there to take that away or, or to yeah. just to let that down. And we could even put it like that to right. give it up. So any thoughts on that or how, how do you, how do we deal with that? Well, I mean, I just, it's, uh, I mean, it is, it's terrifying. It's yeah. terrifying. Even though this thing is, is killing me, it's still where I go for my comfort. It's still where I go for everything, yeah. right? It is my solution. It wasn't the problem because I put the cork in the jug and don't pick up the cocaine anymore. And I'm crazy without some type of program or something to keep me kind of centered, spirituality, yeah. God, you know, all that stuff. But I think the thing is that um, it's like I called my sponsor one time. I was 17. I mean, I hadn't done anything in life. I haven't gotten married. I haven't had kids. I haven't had, yeah. hell, I didn't even already have a job. You know what I mean? So I had all these things in my life that were like, Fuck! What am I gonna do? I have nothing yeah. now without alcohol and drugs. And um, uh, and I called my uh, my sponsor, man. He was he's more like a father to me than anything. And I called him and said, man, what you mean I can't drink at my own wedding? Like, how am I gonna do this? He was like, Chris, do you even have a girlfriend yet? <laughs> and I was like, no. He's like, what the fuck are you worried about a wedding yeah. for, dude? I was all the way out there. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
That's funny. And I think that's the thing is that it is truly when they talk about the one day at a time, that's what they're talking about. You know, mm. I get I get centered and get mindful that today this is all I got. man. You know, yeah. it really is about that. Yeah, that's good. Stay, you know? Staying in the moment, being present, all that stuff. Oh. And it's hard when you have a mind that is constantly working too. like, you know, it's just oh, yeah, it's dude. on the go, on the go. I think a lot well, of people I think who that's struggle. The important part, I mean, I think that's the important part of what fellowship is. Right? Mm. And some people lean way into fellowship. Some people don't lean enough into fellowship. But for me, if you're going to take away that, I've got to learn how to have fellowship in my life. And people yeah. think that having fellowship is just kind of something that happens. No, I had to learn that because I didn't mm. know what a best friend looked like. Yeah. I didn't know what confidence, you know, loyalty looked like on the on the recovery end. Nothing. So, you know? so when you say fellowship, you know, and and you and I kind of know what that means, but there may be someone yeah. listening who's going, "What the? You know, I don't really understand." So, what what is fellowship? Right. Just to break it down, simple. Yeah. Well, because I my my instinct go to is I'm different than you. Yeah. All day long, I'm different. Yeah. No matter who you are, I'm different. You don't understand. Mm. So I got to find people in my life that that are just like me, right? I mean, because giving them my own devices, my best thinking got me where I was at. So I was open to the idea of, okay, I could find some people in my life, whether, what, whatever 12-step community you, you attend or whatever fellowship, having that fellowship around me was really important that I was going to have to find people around me that were going to be able to not only love me up and, and, and keep me um, keep my head on straight, but also, man, keep me accountable. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and help me not only just not drink anymore. It's about how do I live my life without alcohol and drugs? Mm. That was the big thing, you know? Yeah. So, and I think, and the only way I knew how to find that was go where I fit. So, and that's what I did. They said, Hey, go to this thing, go to that thing. You're going to find people there that are just like you. And yeah. I was like, well, I'm used to doing that because I used to go to jail all the time. Right. <laughs> people just like me, but that yeah. didn't work. So I'm going to go try to feed over here. So I was like, yeah, I'll do it. Yeah. You know, cause Joe told me, man, Joe, that dude, Joe, he saved my ass. He said, you know yeah. what? You, um, if you do everything we tell you to do, and you don't stop until I tell you, you'll, you'll never have to experience this pain again. Mm. And that was you know, 35 years ago. And that dude was right on the money. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that's tough for a young man or a grown man, you know, yeah. at that time who sure. we, I think just naturally the human instinct is to not want to be told what to do, especially as a dude. It's like, don't tell me what to do. I'm not listening to you. I got this, you know? And so to yeah. be able to like put that, lay that down and lay that ego yeah. down and lay all of that crap aside and go, okay, yeah. hey, I'm willing to take some direction. I'm willing right. to kind of surrender to this and listen to somebody who's been there and who's done it before. And that's a yeah. huge thing. If huge. you know, we get in a spot and we're able to do that, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, and nobody talks, I mean, I mean, no people do talk about the gifts of it, but I mean, like it's, it's astonishing that the things I've received from people in recovery, it's mm -hmm. astonishing that how many people show up when I need it or how I'm able to give back when I, when they need it. Yeah. It's like, thank God we're not all sick at the same time. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> and I've had people, that's, men that stepped in my life when things were rough and I've been able to step into other men's lives and make a difference when things were, I was, I was not a giver. I was a complete taker, you know? Yeah. And I'm, for instance, I was at a, a young people's conference this weekend and shout out to my guys from Montreal. They're driving back from Austin, Texas to Montreal today. And, uh, and man, it was, you know, four or five of us just hanging out and smoking cigars and nice. our I'm, I'm blown away by men that we can sit there and be emotionally open and talk about things that yeah. men normally don't talk about, you know, mm -hmm. about recovery. Being like, how do you deal with sexual abuse, you know, being in recovery or emotional abuse or physical abuse from your past that pops up? Or, yeah. I mean, we were having some conversations that were deep, you know? And meaningful. I've never been able to find that anywhere. Meaningful. 100% yeah. like life changing. Yeah. Really. Yeah. It's funny that I think the deeper that, you know, for me, like the more that I go on this path and like into recovery and just my, you know, relationship with God, yeah. I find it harder and harder to have meaningless conversations. <laughs> like I'm just not interested. I mean, every once in a yeah, while, I mean, it's okay. I, I, yeah. Well, I love yeah. talking some baseball or whatever like that, but sure. I would much rather spend my time talking with somebody yeah. where we can help each other and share experiences oh, versus yeah. just some that old drunken BS talk where, right. you know, that like there was, there was no meaning yeah. to it. It was just, it was stupid, yeah. you know? Um, yeah. I mean, I'm really, I'm really clear too that it's like, I couldn't have those conversations with men now if I wouldn't have done what Joe told me to do. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah, with working good. the steps and doing the stuff out of the book and really getting clear on my recovery path yeah. and, I, and finding this God, you know what I mean? I had no idea what God was and that, yeah. that that's why I have the people in my life today. I mean, really, you know, yeah. cause I wouldn't open up otherwise. I didn't yeah. have that type of, I had so much fear about you and everybody else in the world. You know, there's no way. Mm -hmm. I'm 
know? Yeah, that fear is real too. And I, uh, real. I, I just want to show, I'll, I'll make it, I just want to share a really quick story because it's so, it's so oh, relates yeah, please, to please, this please. real fast. Well, and I, I feel yeah. like someone needs to probably hear this right now is I would, you know, my, my, my own father, I love him, man. And he's still out there struggling. And, uh, um, you know, this was year, this was probably five, six years ago. And I was talking with my sponsor yeah. one day and I was try trying to work through a lot of stuff with him and dealing with, you know, lots of different elements from childhood stuff to current <clears> present <throat> stuff. And I was bitching and complaining and just kind of going off. And, and my, my sponsor, buddy C man, just a great dude. He goes, will you shut the fuck up? And I'm like, what? And he's never ever talked to me kind of like that. I, th I think that's, at least that's how I heard it back then. You know, I think that was close. And I go, wait, well, what man? And he goes, you're sitting here bitching and complaining about your dad. He doesn't do this. He didn't do that. Blah, 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 yeah. blah. He goes, you set expectations that your dad will never meet. And that's your fault. He goes, look at all yeah. the great men that God oh, yeah. has put in your life. You know, you have, yeah. you have me, we work together. You have this guy, that guy, you know, your guys at the church, like your men's group, like he just went down the list and I'm just like, man, you're right. And it was this light bulb moment. Like sometimes we can't control the cars yeah. we're dealt, but we have to be able to work through yeah. them and not play that victim mentality role. Yeah. You know, that just yeah. destroys us in, in the long run. Yeah. One of them victims don't say sober. Yeah. <laughs> I you know what I mean? yeah that's don't. for sure yeah. and we've all played it you know we've oh, all yeah. played it and i think that's the beauty of what we have is how do we become accountable to things in our life yeah. we don't want to be accountable to yeah you know and the same thing happened with me with my stepdad a guy had the balls to fucking say look dude okay we understand he's all things wrong what do you do right and yeah. i was like what i didn't even think he ever loved me and the guy goes mm. did you ever ask him and i was like no way my ego won't allow me to ask him because if I ask him, if he says yes, I won't believe him anyway. So <laughs> yeah. I'm already, I'm already, I'm, I'm more about being right than I am having a relationship yeah. with my dad. And then I finally asked him and he fucking bawled like a baby. I cried and, mm. and everything was squashed, you know? Oh, it's great. And, man. Um, it's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, so I yeah. haven't been able to, I mean, I've gone through a major stuff in recovery that most people I don't know if could have made it through it. I didn't think I could make it through it. It yeah. wasn't for, recovery stuff and the tools we have today be able to go through it and be able to just get outside the victim and actually yeah do some fucking work around it and next you know you're free from it you know yeah it's pretty yeah, amazing. That's good yeah the work man is crucial you definitely have to put the work oh, yeah. in and patience and there's going to be ups and downs but like yeah. you said man it's so worth it like it's so worth it and um yeah. I, I talked to so many dudes, man, who like it, there's the one thing in common with a lot of us is like we, we do have issues with family, with whether it's our fathers, our yeah. mothers, a lot of yeah. a lot of that in our we, my, my wife and I are in a marriage group and um, it's called Intimate Encounters. And every week, mm -hmm. you know, a, a different couple shares uh, some of their story. And I swear, I think there's eight dudes in this group and every single one of us had some sort of issue, whether it was abuse or yeah. alcoholism or something with yeah. their father, you know, and we, yeah. it's it's so hard to deal with that stuff if you can't see your own, you know, loved ones trauma and shit that they went through as a kid. They're yeah. a human being too. Like in there, yeah. like you said, I had to ask him like, well, you know, what, what happened to you? What, what did you go through? You start to learn that. And man, it's uh it's, it's a lot of work, but man, yeah. alcohol is just the tip of the spear, I guess is what we're getting at oh, here. <laughs> yeah. It really yeah. Is, man. I mean, yeah. I mean, I was having a conversation with my mom not long ago about, isn't it amazing that I have kids, my cousin has kids, all our family have kids. You know, we all have kids now that are grown and they're, they're over, you know, 17, 18 years old now. And my daughters are 17 and 21 and none of them been to jail yet. <laughs> it's mind blowing. <laughs> like, it's not our family. Right. Yeah. And they're, and they're actually successful and they're actually kind and they're loving. And it's just, it's just crazy to see how, how they grew up versus how I grew up, how my mother grew up, how her mom grew up. It's just yeah. so much difference, you know? Yeah. That's um, a, it's awesome. But, you know, I mean, recovery runs deep in our family still. We have that's my, me and my cousin Avery were sober, and yeah. but everybody else is in their own, in their own, in their own way, in their own recovery. You know, yeah. my kiddos are very aware that even though alcohol is not a part of our life, the isms are, you know, mm -hmm. especially when dad gets up in there and, and stops doing what he needs to do on a daily basis. I get miserable shit and they have to deal with it. So they're yeah. really, they're able to cope and, and 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 have the tools to communicate a lot of the stuff that goes on in our family. Yeah. We're cool. like, Dad, you need to get to a meeting or call somebody. Dude, quick. <laughs> yeah. name. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> hey dad, we need to talk. I know what that means. Yeah. All right, kids, you know? I just yeah, cool. I'm kinda yeah, that is awesome, man. Um, it's great just being open with them like that. I love that. I Yeah. You know, yeah. mine are uh, 14 and, and 10 and we're very open with them. Nice. And yeah. they they know, you know, they they you know, we, we've talked many talks and we continue to do that, and, but I'm not naive enough to think that like 
just because I don't drink and the stuff I've been through, they, they're not going to be presented with that opportunity one day, you know, or yep. that, that decision yep. to make. And I just pray that they make the right decision yep. at the end of the day. But hopefully, you know, we've, you know, given them some tools and stuff, like you yep. mentioned, like where they can identify yep. it and call it out That's for it. what it is. Um, true, let's, true. uh, let, let's switch gears a little bit, man. I want to talk about yeah, global breakthrough awesome. your, your business. Like, so yeah. how, how did you start that? Like, how did you get into, you know, going from being somebody in recovery who's still in, in recovery, but then kind of transitioning true. into helping others and then, and then full blown right. entrepreneurship and making a, a business out of it? Yeah, man, I, you know, I, I mean, definitely had to, I, everything I got, I've learned from other people a lot of times. I mean, so I always go back to the men in my life that taught me certain things. And, and I had the gift of a gentleman that sat me down one time. He was in the industry. And he's also sober. And he said, man, he goes, 60 something percent of the, the therapists that are in this industry drink again if they're in recovery. He goes, because really? they forget about the 12 step work. They forget about their own recovery and they just put everything into their work. Wow. And he goes, you got to look at it. It's got to be a job. Even though our job is about passion, even though our job is about saving lives it's still a job and I've got to make sure my cup is full. So yeah. that's the first thing, you know, but I mean, I started off, like I said, doing a lot of different things and I thought I was going to be a clinician forever. And I got licensed. I moved to Texas when Ann Richards was governor of Texas. So we opened up some great things around the country. Mm -hmm. I mean, the state of Texas. And then, and then I, um, I opened up a lot of treatment centers in a lot of different areas. And, and I was a therapist for a long time. I went to private practice therapy and I just, I just kind of was sitting there, you know, and I'd have, a, I'd have clients an hour a day and I just didn't feel like I was able to do what I could do. Mm. I felt like it was, wasn't enough time. And, yeah. um, and so finally, man, I kind of got out of the industry for a couple of years because, you know, isms, regardless of alcohol, isms still kick your butt at times in life yeah. and life happens. So, um, and I went through divorce and I went through a lot of changes in my career and just completely stopped for two years. And so what I did was, before then, I just kind of started like a 95. I started looking at like more of the transports and coaching stuff. Like I was doing a lot of corporate coaching and, mm -hmm. uh, and I realized like these are big coaching workshops for quote the normie people in the world that I was doing. And, and I had some great mentors that helped me kind of go that direction. But I kept thinking, how could this serve our population of addiction and how could it work mm -hmm. with that? So, yeah. you know, and kind of got, I kind of got connected with a whole bunch of people in, in the early 90s and, doing transports for different places and then um, started doing these companion things. There wasn't even a word companions up today. We just called it kind of babysitting, you know, at the time. And it was basically just sitting on somebody brand new coming into treatment or leaving treatment, needs some extra support on the outside. Mm. And they got, I got kind of jumped in with two or three people in California and a couple in, in, in that were doing it in Florida. And we kind of just start, started talking back and forth and the whole companion coaching thing and coaching back then wasn't in every, every you know, recovery coaching wasn't in every word. Yeah. You had a lot of life coaching, corporate VIP coaching. And I did all that. Yeah. And so in like 95, 96, I got certified doing interventions. I quit a full-time treatment center job. And I was like, you know, I went on my own and private practice. I didn't really wasn't there. So I got out of that a little bit, but I started developing or building this thing, this vision I have of, of what could it be like to give people accountability um, on a level that works, um, mm. not just 24 seven live-ins. Be, and I, I love those. I mean, those are great to have, you know, for yeah. accountability. Uh, but maybe coaching could be done in an easier way as well, which is not every family wants you to live with them. You know what I mean? Yeah. So we're able to do that. So I started kind of designing or building this thing where we actually put together a full on plan. Mm. And it's not just babysitting anymore. It's not just hanging out. It's actually a pl action plan, you know, and that is to immerse the person in recovery as quickly as possible and get them connected with that community with a solution. And then also um, coach them on every other area of their life, you hmm. know, so whether it be job, whether it be education, relationship, family. And so then, uh, yeah, I started doing that. And then so I do a lot of coaching around coaches, like coaching them how to work with other people and, and, um, and interventions and, and doing all that and bring guys on board. And we have women that work with women and men work with men. And, nice. and, uh, and we're, we, can, we can get you a coach that you identify with pretty swiftly, um, you know, so they can be of help and service to you guys. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, I love, I love it. it. Uh, yeah, that's that's great, man. Thanks for kind of breaking it down and sharing a little bit. Like, so it sounds like it sounds like you have a pretty like large and diverse network of yeah. different mm -hmm. coaches, different. Um, I, I would imagine interventionists. The, yeah. inter oh, interventionists as well. Yeah, and, as well. 
different yeah. different programs but is um mm -hmm. you know i i imagine the the basis is the same but each client is a yeah. little bit different each person's a little bit different yeah. so you might have different yeah. needs that need to be met um yeah and, and i think the thing is being able to my job what i love to do is a lot of times is have our coaches work with the i guess the person of interest the client themselves and i get to work with the family so i do a lot of family oh work. got it okay yeah. yeah. You get the hard, you get the hard part. <laughs> uh -huh. But I love it though. Cause I'll even yeah. work with families while the clients in treatment still. Yeah. And I work with the families getting there prepared. And so when they do meet, there's some boundaries set. There's some, yeah. there's some, there's some stuff that's already going on with a family and they're building their own recovery network. And it's oh, cool. that's huge. That's really cool. Yeah. yeah that, that, and that's such it. a good, that, you know, that's it, because the family or the spouse a lot, you know, they, they get kind of left in the shadows sometimes I feel like because this, the yeah. spotlight is on the individual, yeah. you know, who's struggling, which rightfully so they need the help and they need that. Yeah. But then the family, you know, sometimes is just like, they're just kind of stuck, you know? So yeah. Yeah. And they're left in the dark a lot of times. And, yeah. and a lot of treatment facilities, they, they're so busy. Like I know they, they do client calls or family calls where they'll call the families and do their work like that. And some of some places have family programs that the family can attend and all that. But it's still not enough. I mean, yeah, you know, I think they need more. So it's like we can on our, on our end, we we can go out and help the family, support the family, how to make it through this this thing that they have no idea what it is. You know, yeah. they're not supposed to know. They're, they're parents or their wives or husbands. You know, what do you what do you think is most difficult sometimes for a spouse or a family member to to kind of um, identify, and then how do they? Like, how do they navigate their way into helping somebody get help? Like, I don't know if that makes sense, but like, like how, how does somebody like, cause you can't go like, let's say it's, let's say it's, it's a, a husband or a wife, right. And they, right. they're trying to go to their spouse and they can clearly see that the spouse has an issue, but they don't yeah. want to, they don't, they're not going to necessarily go, you need to go get some help or you need to go to an A meter. You need to hire, right. like, uh, you need to go to a treatment center or whatever, because that's, you know, there's going to be the, probably a blowout there. Like, how do you approach something like that? How do you even start to do that? Well, like with the family, they've already probably done that over and over and over again, for the most part. Like, yeah. You need help. You need, why can't you quit drinking? Why can't you? And they don't understand. So my, my first thing is trying to, get them to back off a little bit and educate mm. the family about what they're doing. Got it. You know, because yeah, yeah cause, cause the, if advice worked, we would not be here right now. You know what I mean? We'd have been, <laughs> we'd have been true. doing something else in our lives. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And That's parents true. have a lot of great advice, but they don't know what we're dealing with. Yeah. And so it's really important. They have that knowledge and that information. So education, and like education is a huge part huge, of it. Yeah. Huge. And also it's like, for me, it's about having compassion for the families as well. Mm. and have an understanding of where they're at. And if I can't understand, if I can't identify them, be able to share that with them. And then, you know, be able to show them kind of, if they're willing, because that's the hard part with families. Families are not always as willing as the client even. Yeah. They have a lot of their own delusions around what they need and don't need, you know. Yeah. So sometimes it's hard to deal with that. So, do you, and just, I'm just trying to like, just, you know, it's something real simple that somebody could do right now. Like you yeah. mentioned Al-Anon earlier, would you say that's a great oh, place yeah. to start for some free education and community for somebody to go to and go, okay, let me check out an Al-Anon meeting and just yeah. start there. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm a, I mean, I'm a believer in the 12 step stuff. So look, yeah. it, there's a whole bunch of different ones out there for families. There's family anonymous Al-Anon. If your spouse is you know, suffering alcoholic and go to Al-Anon, check that out. There's, Emotions Anonymous. There's a lot of different 12 step programs out there. And some of them I've never experienced them. I have, but yeah. I think for the biggest, for the families, it's really, really, really awesome. And they'll get a lot of information. And, um, and it's not just getting information. It's about working a program. So, because I, the way I just, I kind of explain it to them very simple. It's like the addict is obsessed on the drugs or alcohol and you are obsessed on the addict. Mm -hmm. So your obsession on the addict has caused you how much discomfort in your life how much disease, you know? Yeah. And it's like, and they can see that, you know, then I go, this is why you need these certain things because that will show you and help heal the wounds for one that have been caused by us. And then number two is be able to educate you and give you some peace of mind, no matter what that person does, yeah. you can have a peace of mind, you know? Yeah. I love it. So um, the, yeah. so if we're, so if we're talking and we're, we're going to wrap up here in just a minute, man, but I just yeah, have yeah. like two, two more Good quick luck. questions. Um, Please. if, um, if we're talking about whether we're talking about 12 step for a sponsor, 
um, a mentor, a private coach, like all those things, uh, they're similar, just different aspects. Um, Mm -hmm. maybe, uh, like why is that so important to Mm -hmm. have one of those in in your life? Yeah. Well, first of all, I always make sure I'm real clear on coaching is not sponsorship. Sponsorship is not coaching. We we're we're really, really strict with how we uh, approach that because it's like coaching. I don't want to drift over into any 12 step lane to where I become, Mm -hmm. I, 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 will, I will violate their traditions. And for me, yeah. that's the most important. So our lane as a coach is really, really, really clear. Um, so it is important to have a coach, have that accountability for extra accountability. And then, but, but I, the way I explain it is that coaching and therapy is temporary. We're mm-hmm. not going to be in your life forever on that level. Sponsorship, 12 step meetings, that's permanent. That's mm-hmm. your life. That's forever. Right. That's a good way to so, put it. So that's a, yeah. And I mean, and so it's like, I, I still sponsor guys. I still work. I do all that stuff. Right. Because yeah. My job's over here. And that's what I do for my, own, my own recovery stuff. Yeah. If that, if that, I hope that answers I, No, it does. And that's a great way to put it. Yeah. I've never heard it like that. And I think it goes, I think it kind of wraps back to your point also of, um, at, uh, at the beginning of the conversation when you, when you were talking about just taking care of self too, and making sure yeah. that you're still yeah. doing um, you know, your work for, for you to stay sober in your own recovery, because it's so yeah. easy to get burnt out. Yeah. God, and you can ask them, women and men that work for us. Um, that's one of the first questions I ask them is what are you doing for yourself? What are you doing in your own recovery? Cause I want to make sure they're, they're clear on what their job is and then how they need to maintain their own sobriety and do their own stuff. Because if not, you know, where the job will go away. Oh you know? yeah. You can't, yeah. you can't do your job if you're struggling like that. Yeah. So, yeah, good stuff, yeah, man. Cool. I, I I appreciate you coming on today uh, and yeah, and uh, and answering some questions and giving us some good yeah. some good knowledge and um, all that stuff. And um, la- last question, then we'll wrap up. Like, yeah. if if there's someone struggling out there right now, they've heard this conversation, they're going, "Man, like I'm kind of on the fence. I know I need some help. I don't know what to do. Like, where's a good place uh, for yeah. the starter? Can you give them some encouragement or, or hope?" Yeah, just seeking is my favorite word. Keep seeking. Don't stop. Don't give up. I mean, yeah. that's the thing. Yeah. You know, we were all seekers, you know, if we wouldn't, we wouldn't be here. And, and I think that's the whole key is being a seeker. And it's about, there's all, there's a lot of help out there these days. We're, we're blessed yeah. in that aspect of it. You know, uh, it's a lot easier these days. And then, you know, um, I mean, I'm always available for anything when it comes to professional stuff, I'm available to help other people, but I'm also available on the other side of what we do in this great fellowship we have to be able to help be a service to other people suffering from this yeah. thing as well. You know, love it. So, Love it. So um, where, where's a good place folks could connect with you or reach out? And we'll put all the links from everything today yeah. in the show notes so it's easy for yeah, them to find. Yeah, yeah, definitely globalbreakthroughducation.com. And then just there's a section in there they can send me an email and I'll reach out back out to them personally. I usually do it personal. Awesome. So I like to be able to meet people on the front end of things. So yeah, whatever we can do on our end to help support other people. For sure. Cool. Chris, thanks so much for coming on the podcast today, man. I really yeah, appreciate man. it. I really thank you. I love yeah. what you're doing, man. I really do. It's thank cool. you. Hold on one second. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate it. Share, share the podcast with a friend. Hope something spoke to you today. You can connect us once again on Instagram at That Sober Guy Podcast. Go to thatsoberguy.com for more resources. Appreciate you guys tuning in today. Peace, love, and respect. Keep your blood clean.